What is your advice to people wanting to protest this weekend? Are you encouraging people to turn out or should they be staying home due to the health risks? Well, thanks, Ashley. Um, a number of points there. Firstly, I am not going to condemn people uh, that uh, felt that they needed to protest last weekend. But the advice is very clear, and that is that people must listen to what the medical advice is and make decisions based on that. There are also other ways besides uh, taking to the streets that people can get their views across. And we are very much encouraging dialogue with friends, with family, with work colleagues. Take your issues to your local member of parliament. A local member of parliament's responsibility is to reflect what his or her community is saying. So there are a variety of ways to address this issue. Um, in relation to uh, the uh, protests that uh, talked about next weekend, we've just heard on your show of a variety of approaches from different states and premiers. And I think it would do the Prime Minister well not to be antagonistic about these issues, but to actually listen and understand what is behind people's frustration and behind people's anger. I particularly draw to the Prime Minister's attention the actions of his Liberal counterpart in South Australia, who is going to have a high-level meeting with First Nations people to talk through the issues to see what the appropriate actions are in South Australia. Michael Gunner in the Northern Territory is taking a different approach and clearly it is going to be state and territory premiers and first ministers that will decide on what the consequences are if there are, if there are, if there are in fact gatherings next weekend. But the most important thing is to heed health warnings um, and we say that in the understanding of people's passion, uh, frustration and anger. And for the nonsense that's coming out at the moment that this has somehow has been hijacked, I know people that went to rallies last weekend. I know families that have lost people, um, personal experiences as well. Uh, people's passions are high and they are seizing the moment. But health messages must be heeded to and state and territory and first ministers will make the decisions that need to be made. And the prime minister needs to learn to listen and to understand and not be antagonistic. So Lena, just to be very clear on this, and I understand you're saying you're not going to condemn people who attended last weekend, but for people sitting there today wondering what they should be doing, for example, in Melbourne this weekend, where we've seen someone from the protest last weekend now testing positive to coronavirus, you're a federal politician, you hold the Indigenous Affairs portfolio, you're a respected leader within the Indigenous community. So your words, obviously, your advice does carry a lot of weight. Should people, for example, in Melbourne this weekend, be turning out, or when you say they should heed the advice, is what you're saying to them, is your advice actually to stay home? My advice is to listen to what the health uh, warnings are for that weekend and to Which look to within themselves. To, we, no, I'm, not, I'm saying to look within themselves to make a decision about whether they attend the rallies or not attend the rallies. Obviously, the health warnings and the very long um, process that people have endured in this country of self-isolation has to be considered. But I also understand absolutely the reasons why people feel that they need to go out. But just make sure that the reasons that you're going out are the right reasons. And please consider that there are other ways to make the point about black deaths in custody and incarceration rates than actually um, protesting on the street. And I ask people to consider those three points of view. There are the health risks. There are also the economic ramifications. Are the protests worth it? in terms of the extra delay we're likely to see in lifting of restrictions. Scott Morrison has made it clear that restrictions may need to stay in place longer as we wait to see the results of those protests and whether there is a second wave. That comes with a billion dollar hit for the economy. It is a high price to pay. Well, it's also a hypothetical at the moment, Ashley. I think the really important and prudent thing 
is to wait and see what happens in two weeks' time. Clearly that is an incredibly important consideration and I do not downplay that at all. But I think it's important that we take one step at a time and understand just how, um, just how passionate people are about these issues. But that with passion, um, Ashley, as you're intimating, comes responsibility. And that's what I am very, very much urging. The Prime Minister has had some strong words to say about this this morning. As, uh, as you know, he's been suggesting that public sentiment may turn against the cause uh, that, that these protesters are trying to highlight if these rallies do continue to go ahead. He was also in a discussion this morning uh, talking about a lack of, a, of slavery being in Australia's history. Mm. What do you say to Australians who, who do argue that slavery, the S word, isn't part of our history here? Well, the Prime Minister has said lots of things this morning, some of them quite ill-informed in my view. Uh, let's start with the issue of slavery. Of course slavery is part of the Australian story. And what Labor is saying and what I'm saying very loudly for all of our, uh, all of our citizens is that the process of truth-telling about the Australian story is probably one of the most powerful um, and constructive things that we can do. Uh, two points on slavery. Uh, the first, of course, is the back, blackbirding um, part of our story where there was a, literally a slave trade between Australia and Micronesia and other Pacific islands, including Fiji, the Solomons, Samoa, and in particularly, particular Vanuatu. The physical evidence is here in Australia by way of the many Kanak families that exist. Some of them are very well-known names like the Belair family, where Bob Belair, the late Bob Belair, grandfather was blackbirded as a young boy from Tanna in Vanuatu. These are people that we know that have been advocating for a long time to recognise that truth. And these uh, very young men, young boys sometimes, were blackbirded from these countries to work in the cotton and in particular the sugarcane farms of uh, Queensland and New South Wales. And of course very quickly there is also the fact that many of the young children that were part of the stolen generations were, in, were indentured laboured out, labour out to farms and households, uh, paid a pittance and then many state and territory governments uh, stole those wages and that is um, slavery in any terms. Linda Burney, as part of that truth-telling, is it time for Australia to start pulling down statues of people like Captain James Cook and James Sterling, for example? Well, there are two points I'd want to make there, Ashley. Um, uh, you know, we have seen, obviously, in America and in Britain, the pulling down of statues. We've also seen that in many other countries when regimes change. My view, and it comes from a, a place of knowing, a place where I worked for 25, 30 years in the education arena, is that if we erase the past, then we can't learn from the past. And that is part of truth. Um, and the most constructive thing, and most statues and memorials are uh, put by local or city uh, instrumentalities, is that the plaques should reflect the whole truth um, and that there needs to be more uh, statues and memorials erected across the country that uh, tell of the, the whole story of those particular places. One that everyone's seen, actually, I'm sure you have, is when you're driving down past Hyde Park in Sydney, is that magnificent... Um, uh, inst installation of uh, recognition of Aboriginal people that fought in the various uh, conflicts overseas for the Australian nation. A brilliant and beautiful uh, reckoning of that truth. The, the statue, uh, the rock plinth that's out at, um, out at Br near Bingra for the Mile Creek Massacre Memorial. These are things that can and are beginning to be done. But I do think that having old school texts, having 
our books from the 30s and 40s is instructive to see and have a look now uh, to what it was said back then, the reflection of the times, and see it in that context. So um, statues need to tell the truth, and truth is going to be the thing that I think will bring Australians together. And what do you make of the so-called cancel culture we're seeing at the moment? Gone, gone with the wind has been pulled from a US streaming service. Comedies featuring their Australian comedian Chris Lilly and Little Britain have been taken off the air because of concerns they have these racist undertones. Is that sort of thing necessary? I think it's important uh, that uh, particularly media outlets and places that you know, make, make films or make... Um, uh, TV shows, uh, books that have been written from a long time ago, like Gone with the Wind, be seen in the context of instructive uh, to people today about what is and is and is not acceptable. What was written th in the 1930s, be it Huckleberry Finn or Gone with the Wind, um, is a reflection of that time. Um, and it is to be examined and to be understood that it's not acceptable um, in this time and the very good reasons that it's not acceptable are based on racist attitudes. But I do very much say let us take this one step at a time um, to make sure that we are not erasing history so that we cannot learn from history. Uh, the second point that I'd make is that we are very hopeful in the Parliament this afternoon to establish a joint, uh, to establish an inquiry through the Northern Australia um, Committee of the Parliament to examine the destruction of Aboriginal cultural heritage, particularly in, um, in Western Australia. We want it to be bipartisan, we want it to be practical and we want it to have real outcomes for the people involved. That's what our job is as Members of Parliament. Well, yes, and we are seeing reports coming through today that BHP has been given approval uh, to, which will essentially see another at least 40 Aboriginal sites in the Pilbara to expand an iron ore mine destroyed despite opposition from traditional owners. So we'll follow that one closely and uh, see how you go with that in the Parliament this afternoon. Linda Burney, the Shadow Indigenous Affairs Minister, appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley.